everyone. My name is Yu Zhang. I'm currently a postdoc at the uh, University of Montreal and um, working on merging neuroscience research with AI techniques. And today my topic is uh, about how to use uh, graph convolutional neural nets to do brain decoding. Um, so brain decoding has been one of the classic uh, problem topics in uh, neuroscience research with the goal of inferring a brain state given a short time series of the brain scans. Um, so in the literature there are like mainly two types of the methods including like uh, using stati uh, statistical test and generalized linear model and uh, another type is to use more like modern wise the machine learning uh, method for instance using classifier like SVM. Sorry, the, the laser was too light. Um, to use SVM for uh, to classify like two different conditions, and this in this project we actually try to use a different method that was actually merging um, the network neuroscience part with uh, the neural net uh, deep neural networks. So um, the graph signal processing and additioning the graph. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the graph signal processing and additionally the graph, uh, graph Laplacian method has been widely used in, in the neuroscience research. For instance, um, um, Agulus has used it to generate the connect, uh, connectivity gradients. <laughs> and furthermore, we can use it um, to um, get the harmonics of the brain connectomes. And additionally, there is something even fun that we can do is to apply the graph uh, Fourier transform directly to the functional imaging data and transferred it into a spatial domain. And those um, different frequency modes could even um, associate with different kinds of behaviors. And so in this project, we try to uh, bring the idea of graph signal processing with and merge with um, the neural networks and would give us the graph convolutional neural networks. And in this framework, the key steps was to use the graph filtering, and, uh, which is also called graph convolutions. So the difference between the classical 2D convolutions and the graph convolutions um, is shown in this example. Uh, like in, in the classical 2D convolutions, we have the neighbors defined by the spatially, and we do a weighted sum in the neighbors. Um, but in the graph convolution, the neighbors are actually defined by uh, adjacency matrix. And then by applying the graph for Fourier transform, we could define different types of the graph convolutions. So in order to use this framework um, in the brain graphs, we need to define two key concepts. One is the nodes, and another is the edges. So for the nodes, we're using, actually using the Glasser's multi, uh, model atlas, which include like uh, 360 regions. And for the um, edges, we're using uh, the resting state connectivity that was calculated by a, a large group of the subjects in and we use it as adjacency matrix. So by now we have already defined the brain graphs part and uh, another important part of the inputs was actually um, the time series matrix was, uh, which was a 2D matrix um, um, with the dimension of the brain regions and uh, with the time uh, components. And um, fMR signal was inputted in the pipeline and will be extracted only uh, according to the time events. Like by this, uh, by this time, um, for instance, the motor task happened. And then it will be goes into like six layers of the convolutions and then two layers of fully connected and then using a softmax to uh, predict the task labels. And so in order to train this model, we we actually using the data from Human Connectome Project, which uh, it's like a tremendous uh, data set, including uh, 1,200 healthy subjects that had been went through like seven different cognitive domains, including more than 20 different con uh, cognitions, uh, <coughs> cognitive tasks. The detailed information of the, of the task was uh, listed here. So we applied our model to uh, this data and we found that even by using only 10 seconds of fMR time series, we could do the prediction pretty well and the accuracy we could even reach as high as almost 19%. Um, and in here, we are actually showing the confusion matrix which indicate the, the values indicate how, uh, how many samples was uh, classified as the, the correct labels. So on the left, we have the true labels and um, uh, on the um, x-axis, we have the predicted labels. And, and then uh, we try to summarize um, the big confusion matrix into a small one by uh, summarizing within each cognition. And we found that 
all the conditions are highly defined, in, in, but some of them have like uh, some misclassification. For instance, here it's a relational uh, processing task and working memory task. Um, they were kind of uh, misclassified because it's highly similar in the stimuli itself because they both involve the visual pattern processing as introduced in the previous keynote speech. And so next, uh, since we already have very nice prediction accuracy, we was wondering, like, how can we make sure the network actually using something meaningful? So there is one way to do that is to using the guided back pro uh, propagation. And what it does is actually assign um, a silent value to each of the input um, features if the valence of the feature will cause a big change in the output. So here is an example of uh, on the AlexNet that has been trained on the ImageNet. So there, um, the input is the three different images. We can see that uh, the ceilings map actually follows the shapes of the objects. So I will skip the math here. Um, so we apply this approach to our trained GCM model and, and find out there are some interesting features that have been extracted. For instance, for the language task, we have this nice shape of the language um, mod networks, including the inferior frontal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus. And for the motor task, we have the motor and sensory cortex even. And um, another example is for the working memory task. Here we only uh, show the results on the zero back, and then we, we could actually see a nice distinction, uh, distinction between uh, the uh, in recognition of the face and, um, and place images, which is aligned like, very beautifully with the literature here. Um, <coughs> so as a second type of the validation method, we were using this method called uh, representational similarity analysis. What it does was actually to um, extract the similarity between the features that have been, has been generated by the networks. So we call that was as a high level graph representations. So what we first do is directly mapping those um, uh, high dimensional graph representation onto a 2D dimension. And we could see that um, the five different classes was actually um, distinguished quite well. And uh, um, after that, by comparing the pi, um, the appeal-wise, the correlations between the graph features, we have this nice block-wise design. And after uh, averaging within each class, it's even clear of the structure. And, and from here, we can see like it's highly similar within um, the conditions, and, um, and there were mod moderate correlations between left and right movements, and, but very low correlations across different movements. Um, so by far, we have um, very nice prediction first, and then we have two methods of, um, to prove like um, w the model actually generates something uh, biological meaningful features and also uh, class uh, category specific features. And then we want to even uh, go further and ex explore, um, um, like by um, explore how, how far can we push of the model, like in terms of the two parts, one is, um, how short of the time beams that we can put. Another is how many data samples we need in order to train the model. Um, so the first, uh, first we actually found even by input of one single fMR volume, the model works. And um, here we actually sample like two different time beams of that. But um, um, after that, we try to plot the accuracy, the performance of the model um, by as a function of uh, the time after the task onset. So from here, we can see like it actually follows nicely with the HRF function, with initially a, um, a dip around four seconds and then a, peak, a high peak around six seconds. And after six seconds, we can see like the performance can go high as 95%. And remember, this was only using one fMR volume. And because the, the single fMR volume data might be noisy, so we replicate this um, experiments like with uh, six seconds of time beams, uh, and we find the same pattern. And even in not only in the motor task, but also the working memory task, or even including all different kinds of the six different tasks. 
Um, so the second factor that we explore is the sample size. Like, so in here, uh, we actually find we don't actually need the 1,000 subjects from the HCB data, but with the around 200 to 300 subjects, the, the model could actually get a very stable performance. And even for the task that uh, was identified as easy task, for instance, the motor task and language task, with uh, seven, around 70% uh, 70 subjects, we could get very nice results. So uh, last but not the least, uh, we also um, explored the factor of uh, um, what's the impact of choosing different graphs. So here we um, um, ex did the experiments on two, uh, four different um, graphs, including the spatial information, the structural covariance, and the functional connectivity and uh, diffusion um, tractography. And uh, from the results, we see that the functional graph and the anatomical graph um, showed a very similar performance during training, um, but both of them are much better than the other two graphs. Um, so after we got this very nice architecture in for brain, uh, decoding, we were wondering what kind of applications we can use for the model. Um, there are actually two cases, um, use cases for the transfer learning. So the first part is we could use this model um, for a different, like, uh, different data set which has much smaller uh, samples. For instance, here we did the experiment on the individual brain charting project, which only includes 12 subjects and going through the same HCP protocol. And we found high um, promotes on the accuracy um, for the task prediction. And the second use case is um, we could use, uh, um, use this um, task prediction to, to actually predict the performance inside of the scanner, um, the behaviors including uh, the reaction time and uh, accuracy of the performance. So here, first we saw a nice association between the two terms, between the uh, performance of the GCN and uh, the um, average reaction time in scanner. And, and furthermore, we want to actually build a regression model that could directly predict uh, the, the trial performance. Um, so in the future, we would like to apply um, this method to generalize the, into individual brain annotation. Um, so in this experiment, because we are using 1,000 subjects from the Human Connectome Project, it was based on the group model with the group brain, but in order to adjust it to the individual brain, we will need individual um, brain parcellation and individual graph, probably even like a dynamic graph. And, and the second part, we would like to explore more cases of the transfer learning based on the pre-trained model. Um, and last, um, but very importantly, we could use this pipeline for the more clinical application. For instance, we could predict different stage of the dementia um, in the MCI and AD patients. Um, so at last, um, I would like to thank my team in the CMAX lab, especially my supervisor, Pierre Black. And also, I want to thank uh, the generous um, fundings from Ivado and Neuromod, which make this project happen. And, and I also want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Maybe I ask one. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, have you considered applying this technique to um, neural population, uh, neural recordings? Yes, it will be very interesting application. But in, at the current stage, we don't have the data because it's very hard to get the public data set of that. But if there is anything available, we'd like to try. Yeah, so it will be very what's interesting. What's the limiting factor there? Is it just number of subjects or just the amount of data per subject? What's the um, yeah, because our current model was actually like a group model, like population-wise model. So it doesn't matter, like uh, just in amount of the data sample, either within the subject or like across subjects is fine. So because in our pipeline, we actually cut the, uh, the entire um, task time series into bins of uh, data samples. So we could generate hundreds of samples from one subject. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? If not, let's move on.